So we set down some ground rules about how we'll handle public comment. Why don't we just follow the practices the city council has had, where they give folks the three minutes to say their piece at the beginning, and then once we've gone through that, then we can switch on to our agenda. I just, yeah. I, I, my experience the other day on conference committee was that it, it felt a little bumpy, and it felt like there were agenda items. I mean, I appreciate what you just did in terms of asking the audience what they were here to talk about, and if there are specific agenda items that they have a curiosity about. But if there's somebody here just to say their piece to us, it's giving the opportunity to do that, and then we'll fit the agenda in, in taking things out of order as we typically do as a courtesy. Is that clear? Yes. I thought we had discussed last time that we would parameters for the public speaking part of it, that that would be on the agenda for this week. And it's not. Yeah, I, that's, that's fine. So. But that's all right. We'll do it next time. But let's have a discussion. So we put that on the agenda for next time. Because you meant really public comment. You didn't mean talk about parameters. Right. Yeah. So I just think we ought to have a broader discussion where we lay out MJ's great ideas and, um, and maybe we all have more great ideas. But have an opportunity to, to come up with a formal procedure. All right. But next like time, because we didn't make it this time. All right. So call the meeting to order. There's a motion, a second. All in favor of taking solid waste out of order? Aye. 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 Great. Book book club. Sure. <laughs> sure well, we just um, we've heard rumors that uh, they're talking about moving. The bookshed, and we have concerns about that, and we wanted to stay on top of it before, okay. you know, anything happened. Are we it's gonna... been put out to the public that I'm hearing right. that it's a done deal, that it's being moved. All right, so let's let's so explore this for a moment. Um, that is not true. Um, I've had one conversation with one gatekeeper, a conversation with Karen, about potentially moving it because of people spending more than usual amounts of times leaving their vehicles parked in areas that people use for waste disposal while they peruse the bookstore. So there's a casual conversation going about, but there's no decisions made on what's going to happen. What are you, what are you thinking of? I don't have enough input from the gatekeepers as to whether it should move or not if it's a problem. I heard it from one gatekeeper that on Saturdays it can be somewhat of a problem, but I haven't heard it about any other day but Saturday. Um, yeah, I've heard that too. <clears throat> that uh, from the guys who work on Saturday. Uh, I guess from my point of view, it's like if you've ever been in the bookshed, it's like a standing area of three feet by two feet. Mm -hmm. You can't really get <laughs> it's a, a lot of people yeah. in there. Yeah. So, I mean, we're talking with a, a max of two parking spaces that might be taken up. And my feeling, too, is if you move it over here, it's not going to change that. People will still park there and walk to the bookshed over there and stand. So it's like, I'm not understanding why this is a big issue, really. It's not a big issue as far as I'm concerned. I mean, okay. the, the conversation mm -hmm. came up sometime late last week. I think it was mm -hmm. Thursday. Mm -hmm. Right. So I don't, I don't hear it as being a huge issue. which is brought up in conversation. Right. Well, so I guess we were just hoping from the board that before you do make a decision, uh, you would be put it out. Gary's the um, leads the volunteers who clear it out. When we originally came here about the bookshed, we had agreed that you know we'd set up volunteers, we'd get it fixed, which we did. We did all of that yeah. and more. And they keep it cleaned. And he comes in Saturday sometimes twice to check to make sure that it is clean. So I would hope that there would be an engagement with volunteers before any final decision is made, just to get out another opinion. Okay, thank you. That's what we're here for. It, there's potentially a lot of issues that have, we'd have to deal with if we did move it. And, yeah. yeah. Okay. So. Jim? <laughs> Terry, sometimes things like this are managed by staff and we don't actually always bring them to the board in terms of operational things so. don't like this. So um, Ned and I are happy to, to talk to Sue so, yeah. at any time or Karen or try to work out the issues. And uh, sometimes things don't always rise to the level. Yeah, it's not really a policy right. decision. Right. <clears throat> but we appreciate knowing. Sure. But just yeah. so that, that, they, that they, the volunteers are engaged in sure. the conversation, that would be great. Yeah. Okay. So you all talk amongst yourselves. And... Yeah. Okay. Great. Okay. That's all we're here for. Great. Thank, thank you. Thank you. <laughs> and thank you for your work, Gary. Keeping it organized. <laughs> right. So could we get a, a report on, Jim, do you want to give us an update on, I assume you, that's what you were, or, or not. <laughs> <laughs> so, I'm on vacation tonight. <laughs> <laughs>
Uh, and back to Terry is the options that Karen had put up uh, at our last meeting. I told you I would come back with a recommendation. After looking at that and discussing with Karen, I think option two is the way that the board should decide to keep the facility open on Saturdays for leaf and yard waste. It's a consistent plan of the second Saturday and the last Saturday of every month. Instead of uh, a mitts and mats as months go on, they change. So it's consistent. And then the two green dots under option two are for the uh, Christmas tree collection events. One of the things that came to mind in doing this is the manpower staffing required uh, at the other options also. And the fact that when we have the landfill open for leaf and yard waste and small brush materials, we're going to have to have uh, additional manpower up there operating a chipper and a bucket loader and so on. Um, I think that makes the most sense, uh, option two, by having it on these dedicated days for staffing purposes. And it makes the public realize that these are the days that we're open, and they'll get used to that over time. And then what does the line mean? I think it's just the week, the week ending on Saturday. And is it the second and, and last, or is it the second and fourth Saturday? It's the second and last Except in August. Except in November. November is the third last. Yeah, no, August and November. Can I make a recommendation that we have it the second and fourth? Because that's really much easier and much more straightforward. That's fine. Terry? I'm sorry. Yeah, it's okay. So Ned, because um, there was a there was a lot of support I think last go around for option four, and you raised the concern about just is it is it a manpower issue? It is a manpower issue. I'm concerned about finding DPW staff to be there, uh, not necessarily the gatekeeper staff, but DPW staff to be there from noon to four o'clock every single Saturday. Right. Well, when it was presented, and I'm forgetting her name, Karen. Karen. Yeah. Karen right. I was. What I was going to say. Um, she indicated that that she felt that um, it, that portion of the work didn't have to be done on the day. That it, for most days, that the, the amount of, for most months, the amount of waste didn't require it to happen during the course of the collection, and it could be something that was done during the week in preparation for the other weekend. My crews are doing other things during the week. <coughs> um, <laughs> yes, Karen. Noon to four seems late. Is that, can, has that been correlated with when the traffic occurs? No. It was an option that Karen put out thinking that it would get the morning hours for the residents to gather their leaf and yard waste and get some work done, and then it would be the afternoon for them to come into the facility. I just think about your, your thoughts about hard I mean, it seems crazy late to me. 10 to 2 or 9, nine to 1 would be. Everyone's accustomed to mm -hmm. Saturday being more on the early side, I think. Mm -hmm. I think the other thing is that there's a little bit of a conflict when Karen was here because she was discussing concerns about the um, number of vehicles coming in and, and, and maintenance of vehicles when they come in, but by shrinking the, the amount of time that people can come in on a sunny day, you, you're actually potentially making traffic conditions worse because there's a smaller window for people to come in. So it, you know, it's a little bit counter to the, the, the thought of trying to manage traffic in a more effective way by compressing the schedule on, on a Saturday for four hours. All right. Just for clarification, is this just for leaf and yard waste? Yes. Yeah. So Glendale Road is proposed to be open every Saturday, Saturday That's for correct. difficult to handle waste. That's correct. Okay. And will it be open all day or just morning? Seven to four. Seven to four yeah. for difficult to manage. Yeah. So essentially, when we go into this program here, it puts people down into the composting area. And at first, thing, manning gate two for the residents to come through. So that way, they're not coming through gate one and traveling across the landfill to get to the composting area. And is the. If you are relieved of the concern of finding people to work late afternoons on Saturday, would every Saturday. It's the, the it's actually the, it's actually them coming in at noon, and all of a sudden their afternoon's gone. Right. I think it'd be a lot easier to find staff 
coming in at seven and working what they deem to be a normal shift, which are typical shifts of seven to three at uh, five days a week. Yeah, you guys have looked at this. I'm, I'm certainly not trying to come in at the last minute and throw dirt up in the air, but <coughs> this is, that's what makes sense. Is only every other Saturday. I think that that's the the trying to have some sort of predictable, reliable schedule that's consistent is, mm -hmm. I think, the most critical thing for us. And and I think that during this next year, we're going to see how things work. Right. I mean, I think we don't, you know, we've never had sort of isolated functions. So this right. year, we're going to figure out who's yeah. really coming in at what time. So you could come in on one of these other Saturdays with a mattress. Sure. Mm -hmm. Or in the, or you could bring the mattress up at the same time you're dumping your leaf and. If it's the second or fourth. If it's fourth. the second or fourth Saturday. Yeah. I don't. Yeah. Noon and four. I don't have the cheat sheet that Karen prepared with me, but um, my recollection was that in some of the other options, the twelve to four window was actually expanded. That when we had fewer days, we had longer hours. Am I am I wrong about that? When we had fewer days, we when we had fewer days. Like when we had option when two as opposed to option four, rather than a four hour stint, we had like a seven hour stint. Well, the other options, option two, are seven to four. They are seven to four. Okay. Right. Okay. All those full Saturdays are seven to four. Okay. The only hybrid of it was option four, which was gotcha. noon to four. Okay. Okay. Is this a policy decision or just? You need to know what you, the board wants to do, and uh, that's what I think we should do, and I'm fine with uh, the second and fourth rather than the second and last. I guess I'm, I'm just got confused. Um, second, I, I like the idea of the second and fourth. I think that's once people start to remember that, it's easier to remember. Um, and, and I'm glad that we're doing it throughout the whole year. I mean, early early thoughts were to just do it in the spring and the fall, and I think we need to do it all year. Um, under option two, right now the proposal is to keep it open, receive leaf and yard waste um, from noon to four in the afternoon. Is that no seven? No seven to four. See, that's what I was confused about. Yeah. That too, okay. So, okay. Then I, I like understand. I like option. Okay. Okay. You like option two. The one, the one that's being proposed. The staff proposal. Right. Staff proposal. Right. Second and fourth right. Saturday, the seven to four for the hours. For the leaf, leaf and yard waste. Yep. And on every Saturday, it'll be difficult to manage. Right. I thought it was See? noon to four. <laughs> no. no. That was the question. That was the question, that was the question I just asked. <laughs> the landfill will be open Saturdays from seven to four. The leaf and yard waste will be on the months that's shown on the option two there. The second and fourth Saturdays, the back gate will be open for acceptance of leaf and yard waste the from 7 to 4. The landfill will not right. be open. The Glendale Road site will be open. The facility will be open. <laughs> yeah. Okay, all right. No, I, I don't know where that 12 to 4 thing came in. All right. Great. That was it. Um, was so, so are you looking for uh, We know it is. <laughs> so we're sure. looking for a motion. That's fine. I'd like to uh, move that we uh, accept the staff proposal, staff recommendation that we do um, Saturday, Glendale Road facility is open 7 to 4 every week for difficult to manage, and the second and fourth Saturday of those months, uh, those second and fourth Saturday of the month, it will also handle yard and waste during those hours. I second the motion. Good. All in favor? All right. All right. I didn't give you a chance to speak. Did you have that? I was just wondering, I didn't even know Glendale was going to actually close. I thought there was still going to be some talk about that, whether Glendale was going to close, because I'm more for having Glendale all open rather than Locust Street. But Just quick, quickly, kind of outside of the, the meeting, only 15% of the people who bring bags of trash in bring them to Glendale Road. 85% mm -hmm. Bring their trash here. And that's these days. <clears throat> also, we don't own the compactors or the roll offs. So it would take about $100,000 worth of stuff <coughs> to accept the bags. Mm -hmm. um, 
and we don't have the correct permits there. We'd have to start the permitting process. So we're stuck in a number of fronts. We don't have the money. The city's not offering to buy the, the, the equipment the compactors are the way it was. So we, don't, we, we can't make enough money from selling trash, trash stickers, basically, to buy those ourselves. Um, not many people use it relative to here. And so when you crunch all the numbers, it's fairly easy to realize that we simply can't afford to run a program at both places. And if it had to be a one, it should, has to be here. Mm -hmm. So if I, if, can I ask about what was just voted on here? So Glendale Road will be open every Saturday from 7 to 4 for the... Difficult to manage for waste. The difficult to manage waste. And is that like large plastics and things? Rigid like plastics, mattresses, appliances. Metals, yeah. And all that stuff. Okay, and then on the second and the fourth Saturday, from 7 to 4 also, will be the leaf and lawn debris and stuff? Mm -hmm. From yes. April to November. Pardon? From April, April to November. November. Christmas trees. Christmas trees. Christmas trees. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Uh, next for your approval, the minutes of the March 27th meeting. Do you want to continue on with this matter? Or you want to come to it? Oh, again? are we? It was a more. I'm sorry. There's some, some more handouts story. that you have on your, uh, on your uh, documents tonight. One is just a transfer station cost comparison. Uh, it's just informational for the board. Uh, different communities and what they're charging for different things, including permit stickers and so on. This is provided by Karen to me. And the second one is proposed bulky waste cost structure, we're looking at the weight, average weight of materials, what we're currently charging, and what we should be charging, or what we th think we should be charging going forward. Um, I know you haven't seen this before, so I'd like you to look at this and see if uh, it's something we want to vote on at the following meeting, uh, next meeting on this matter. So basically, there's a lot of this that is going up anywhere between 50 to 33 to up to 100 percent on some of the items that we currently charge for going up. Now, do we typically vote on the, the fee schedule for the challenging to manage waste? I uh, haven't historically. So this was our proposal going forward, but I want to share it with you and get your thoughts and comments on it. And basically, we need to cover our core costs and not lose money. And that was right. the guiding part of this, this document. Can I make a motion that we leave it to the, the staff to share the information with us, but we leave it to the, the general guidance that they seem to accept that if we're looking to cover our costs, sure. and that they set the fees, that they be responsible for setting the fees for specific items? I would second that motion. Discussion? All in mm -hmm. favor of letting the staff set the uh, fees for difficult to manage waste? Aye. 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 Okay, thank you. Thank you. Including dog houses? <laughs> You never know what's going to come in. I was going to say, how many box letters do you have? I haven't seen one yet. <laughs> so, anything else ready. on solid waste? Um, I think that's it. All right. Okay, now we can talk about the. Can you raise your hand up? I tried. Oh, I'm sorry. Yes, sir. Uh, I took a month off and went to Florida, so I missed some things. Last time I was here, I questioned uh, whether we should be doing paper directly to the mills instead of going to the Merck and getting next to nothing for it, since we've marketed directly. And I think Jim said he was looking into that. And I don't know if it got anywhere. I said it was a good idea. I'm not sure that I said I was going to look in, into it while you're on vacation. Oh, okay. But um, it, it, is, it is something that we want to explore real quick. I think it was a really good point you made. And the other thing is that we are not too long in the future going to be in a super trash crisis. We're in one right now. But the landfills around us are closing. And I've heard that the Cavanta incinerator is at 150% capacity, <coughs> which means that they're picking and choosing what they want to burn, and they're disposing of the rest. So I don't know if we have a long-term plan in place or whether we're just hoping that it gets so bad we can get out of the business completely. One more about this vote that you took here. People are people are accustomed to going to the landfill and quitting at noontime, Glendale Road. And there's nothing more frustrating than going to a place that you've been accustomed to going to and finding the gate shut, like the odd Saturday morning. And I'm just 
wondering what if they're going to do with their spot when they find out they can't put it there. We're going to be open from 7 to 4. I know you are, but that's an extension of your current hours at Glendale Road. Glendale Road currently now shuts at noontime. Mm -hmm. And everybody in the city knows that. And they've been programmed that at noontime you're not going to Glendale Road. So all of a sudden you're extending the hours but cutting the time, the days in half, that they can go there. And I'm just wondering what that's going to do to the psyche of the people doing it. Quit following that. I'm not quite following you. Your apples and oranges to me. Yeah, I think it's open every Saturday, okay. yeah. but only for but leaf and yard waste are only accepted every. I, I understand that, but I'm just saying that the landfill right now closes at noon time on Saturday. Why are you going to the extra expense of extending it until four o'clock, when everybody knows that it closes at noon time now? Thank How you. many people are going to use that extra four hours of expenses? Well, well, we'll find out. I mean, it's... I mean, I just don't want to... Mm -hmm. to ask and it's, as MJ stone. said, this next year yeah. will tell us a lot of information. Yeah. So, I think that comment is interesting, and we have yet to see the empirical evidence, but we will see it. Yeah, I mean, we should know within a few months. All right, one other quickie here. Is, is the Solid Waste Enterprise budget available online? The board hasn't approved it yet. I mean, but when it comes out, is it? We can make oh, it yeah. available, yeah. sure. It's a public document. I mean, wading through some of that stuff is kind of hard to find. It's good stuff. <laughs> um, all right. Just finding it is <laughs> okay. We'll, we'll make sure it's online uh, shortly. All right. Minutes of the March 27th meeting. Thank you. Can we approve the minutes? Second. Okay. Comment or first item about halfway through after cotton tree service. The next line, he said, This is how I think it should be. He said, The question is, should the city be providing commercial enterprise? And what it says now, discussion by the city is that, and then it turns into a question, should the city be? So, okay, just Maybe we'll rearrange the sentence a little bit. Yeah. Did you, all right, so. He gave them to me. Oh, you did, okay, yeah. good. So, anything else about those minutes? All in favor of accepting them? Aye. Aye. As amended? I have seen. It wasn't open yet. Okay, how about March 20th? Mm -hmm. Make a motion we approve the minutes of March 20th. Second. I think it was. <laughs> I was. It was. That was a budget meeting, right? It was. You were there. I. I was there. You were. Any comments about those minutes? All in favor of accepting them? Aye. Aye. Great. Aye. Uh, new business uh, for your consideration: um, the 2000 FY14 water rates for all consumption billed after the end of. Well, beginning in the next fiscal year. So as you know, we went through three budget meetings with uh, various members of the boards. And uh, Terry and I went to the city council a few weeks ago and did a presentation on it. Uh, basically for FY14, we have a, a budget of, in the water uh, enterprise fund of $6,537,079. Uh, with that, uh, the rate increase that we looked at going to that we're looking to have approved tonight is to go from five dollars and forty cents per hundred cubic feet to five dollars and forty seven cents or a one point three eight percent increase. I make a motion that we approve the new rate of five dollars and forty seven cents per cubic foot. Second. Per hundred cubic per hundred cubic feet. Any discussion or questions? Could you repeat the rate again? $5.47? 47 Yes. Right. Per 100 cubic feet? Yeah. Mm -hmm. And this was in line with the conversation that we had at the last meeting. That's correct. So there's no changes. Okay. All in favor of approving the rate? Aye. 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 Okay. Next for your consideration, the FY14 sewer rates for all consumption billed 
beginning July 1st of FY14? Do we have the numbers? Like yeah. <laughs> so the FY14 budget um, was seven million one hundred forty-two thousand nine hundred forty-two dollars. Uh, talking about with the board members and with their presentation with City Council again, uh, the rate was going to go from five dollars and eighty cents to five dollars and ninety-seven cents, or a two point nine percent, two point nine six percent increase. Just a, an um, This must be based on funding um, the industrial park interceptor out of cash that we already have. Yes, yes. correct, and also doing work at the plant, the waterproofing work, the okay. conduits, okay. Right. and the um, pump station alarm and intercom system were included in the town. Okay. All out of cash? Yes. Which will leave us with. The Moody's recommended 266 days plus another half a million or more beyond that. Okay. So it seems like it leaves us in good shape. So any other questions? I only have one question. It goes back to the last grade. I didn't write down the percentage. You said it was 1.38. 1. 1. 1. 1. 1. 1. Yes. Thank you. All in, uh, in favor of approving the FY14 sewer rate as presented. Aye. 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 General fund budget for FY14. So the total request for FY14 is actually um, about a $40,000 budget cut uh, that came from the mayor's office. This year's request is $3,276,596. This includes all, all general funds, parks and recreation, uh, snow and ice, flood control, streets, drain division. I don't think I left any out. Cemeteries. Parks and cemeteries. Um. And this is what we've seen before? Yes. Okay. There's been no change in this. I can't believe they're leaving. This stuff's great. <laughs> um, any questions or comments about the general budget? No. General fund? All in favor of approving the FY14 general fund budget as presented? Aye. 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 And finally, for your consideration, the FY14 Solid Waste Enterprise Budget. So our budget for FY14 is $1,408,008. Um, landfill will be closing, we believe, sometime by the end of May. We'll be going into a large closure project this year that should be wrapped up by October. And then we start our 30 years of post-closure monitoring of the facility. So at this point, um, it looks like we're going to meet all our obligations that we set out to do, including paying off debt service at the landfill that continues into um, 2017. That was a capping project for the online landfill. So it looks like we're in, we're in okay shape moving forward. And is this the number we were looking at earlier? Yes, it is. My question. Oh, yeah. Just that, that we've reviewed these numbers and that this right. is just perfunctory that we're just affirming the affirming the vote. Okay, hey, all in favor of <laughs> all in favor of approving the FY fourteen solid waste enterprise budget as presented. Aye. 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 Great. Hey, thank you everyone. Thank you, Anne Marie. Uh, next uh, vendor food cart. She was waiting. Quietly. Oh, did, <laughs> do, did you have questions that you? Only to a lawyer. So we've had um, some interesting food vending carts appear recently. In fact, there is one that is was downtown for a period of time that's moved outside the central business district for our policy. Um, I met with the Board of Health, the bid, uh, and the mayor last week about this, and at some point there might be a 
question before the board about changing their policy to be somewhat accommodating for vendor carts downtown in certain areas. But I probably should have brought this up on the informational rather than new business because you're not being asked to do anything at this point. But just so you know, we've, we've had an increase, I believe, at the next board meeting. There's a woman coming in who uh, uh, wants to sell hot dogs off a cart, probably in downtown. Uh, the Board of Health is waiting this. They like the idea of having these uh, food booths come in. It's a matter of where we're going to put them and what they take away from downtown or actually enhance in downtown. Uh, to, how do you limit the numbers of them and where are they strategically placed and so on. So I think the conversation is going to happen in the not so near future. Um, there was two pa or one package that was sent out, which was a memorandum from uh, David Narkowitz, uh, Mayor David Narkowitz, uh, Captain Scott Savino, about this particular vendor that was uh, feeding the meter and also working within the Central Business District. So they moved outside the Central Business District at this point, but I'm sure they're anxious to get back downtown. Uh, I was wondering if these are all vehicles on wheels, or are there some of them sidewalk carts? Or the only ones that I've seen so far are vehicles on wheels. Um, there's currently two on the state highway layouts on Route 5 leaving town going south into Hoyoke. There's a, a barbecue place, and there's another vendor that I think sells sausage and hot dogs or something like that down by Atwood Drive. So I, I really don't know what's going to happen with it, and Time will tell. But the bid was somewhat supportive? Yes and no. Their concern is that by taking up the meter space and bagging a meter, this is what happened was they, they actually came in and got two bar parking meter bags for $5 each for the day, and they actually parked right in front of City Hall. Uh, and spaces right there. So that's what, how this whole thing really took off and got started. So uh, the parking division knows they can't sell parking meter bags anymore and they can't be sitting there feeding the meters, which keeps forcing them to move. But what we've seen so far is uh, a pickup truck with a generator in the back of it with a trailer uh, making, I think, fresh sandwiches and goods out of it. Um, in, in some urban areas, particularly the ones that I know, D.C. and Philly, these things are tremendously popular, and they're really effectively restaurants on wheels. Um, they're not... They're not the kind of hot dog stands well, on Those are them. bigger, even bigger ones. Oh, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, and my feeling is, is that they're a really great way to bring in, I don't want to get too deeply into the discussion now because I think we're going to have it, but I, I, would, like to, I would like to think about um, finding a couple of dedicated spots and treating them like other permitted types of activities. Um, so we can avoid the meter feeding thing. I don't. I, unfortunately, I can't think of any place in the downtown that readily sort of lends itself to that. But I think they're a really cool way, cool way to bring other food options into into the area. And they also make it, you know, make it sort of more of a a, 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 a communal usable space, like a walk. I mean, at the end of the day, I would love to see downtown Northampton blocked off entirely, and just a walking mall kind of thing. But I don't know how. I think that we could ever do it. Jim and then a bypass. <laughs> My experience is pretty similar to Chris's in terms of uh, eating from a lot of food trucks. And I lived in the Boston area for a number of years. And uh, actually, in, in the Globe on Sunday, they had a special food edition about all the food trucks in Boston and Cambridge. So they're they're kind of a big deal. They they are like restaurants on wheels, as, as Chris is indicating. Um, so I thought I would say that. And then I'm just wondering about this vendor cart policy that was sent around. To me, this is more like. Uh, hot dog cart on a sidewalk type of policy and not related to food trucks. And I guess at some point this uh, discussion will be moving forward, but yeah. I'm not sure exactly how applicable this is. It's to a 20-some-odd-year-old statute. I, yeah. I think we need to... Yeah. yeah. It was hand-typed. Yeah. I'm not sure exactly. That's what we had. I was just noticing that it was 1991 yeah. when they last had the um, uh, discussion, the public discussion. And I think that, that if we do do this again, we should have a, a well-publicized public discussion because we have a lot of uh, people that um, have contributed to the downtown area in terms of um, food, uh, meals, taxes, and um, dealings. Uh, and they've invested a lot of um, in the infrastructure of, and rent of their building. So I just think that since it's been 
19, since 1991, since we've had public discussion that we ought to wait and hear from yeah, the public. Yeah, you're absolutely right. That's a good point. Uh, I was just going to echo exactly what we just said. I was just going to say that I think Amherst is going through this, and I think I just read in the paper last night, in fact, that they came up with some rules for food trucks in exactly. downtown Amherst. And, and, and designated spots for yeah. them. So who takes the lead in this whole discussion? I would think it would be a combination of the Board of Health that would be permitting these vehicles to take part of the lead. Obviously, the Board of Public Works would be engaged because they are within our layouts, mm -hmm. and we have certain things by ordinance that require permits and so on. So I think it's a combination. Uh, I would imagine the bid would want to see the table also. I would also expect our economic development director to be very much involved. He was at the last meeting. Yeah. Yeah. And, and the one other addition is the license uh, commission because they have approved Dick Schiller's licenses. And as far as the policy uh, being on a typewriter, how, how are we coming on electronic? I thought we were. That, that came from a scan. Yeah, how, but. I know, but it's, it's electronic. Yeah, it's not electronic. <laughs> I thought we were moving towards. We haven't gotten there yet, but. Well, still. Are we 50%? <laughs> we're not. Well, you can just take a question copy and they can scan it and have it made into a Word document. Andy, Andy Keith has been looking at this. I'll talk to Andy tomorrow where we're at with it. But they've been scanned, but I don't think they've done an optical recognition. I know the city has um, tremendous software they have. Adobe Acrobat. No, it's not Adobe. It's, <laughs> it's, it's, this is microfiche. This, yeah, right. This it's, but it's not brain surgery. This this is nope. quite doable. But it was fun to see. <laughs> so that Maybe really we haven't gotten anywhere. <laughs> no, Terry. Well, it's never changed, so we just left it. Right, <laughs> right. So there's no Okay. Change order number two to contract 239-13 to direct plumbing for district-wide plumbing fixture upgrades in the amount of $7,600. Move approval. I thought I was on vacation, but the director's handling this contract to talk to you about. Um, this is the uh, installation of water-efficient um, fixtures, toilets and urinals in city buildings. And the change order is specifically related to um, things that were broken and, and not generally in working order when they were trying to connect the new fixtures to the current plumbing system. So there were a number of uh, additional flanges and valves and things that needed to be put in during the process of installing the new fixtures. So there were um, problems with, uh, with plumbing at New Sandy Beach, Spring Grove Cemetery, Mainsfield, Lawrence Fire Station, several at Smith Boat, and a couple at the Academy where there were new valves or flanges or otherwise um, piping necessary in order to install the new fixtures. So um, that work, um, which was overseen by people uh, uh, in, in the water department when the work was being done and documented that it was being done and appropriately and that sort of thing, and the total uh, value of this change order is $7,677 for the work that was performed. So, sort of what you expect when you're working on another building and replacing something. <coughs> yeah. Question? Where's, where's the funding come for this? Um, some of it is coming from a grant, okay. and then the balance of things that aren't covered by the grant is coming from the water enterprise fund. Favor of approving this change order to contract 239.13. Aye. Uh, change order number two to contract 204 13 to Kleinfelder for the wastewater treatment plant electrical testing protocol in the amount of $149,000. Move approval. Second. I'm going to ask the board to table this discussion. Uh, not the discussion, but table the, the vote on this, but open it up to discussion about what we're trying to do and some of the procurement issues that we're running into and in getting this done and also the cost of it too. Uh, it's grown from what we thought was the vision originally to be about a $50,000 test to now growing to uh, triple that size. Mm -hmm. um, we've met with Elm Electric, we've met with Kleinfelder. Um, we believe we can get the price down on this if we go to unit-based items and put it out as a 
an actual contract, hopefully a 30B contract. If we have to go to Chapter 149 because of the cost of it, it's going to delay this thing substantially down the road as we go out to Designer Selection Board. So we still need to do the test. We want to do the test. It's a matter of how we do it through procurement process. I've asked Kleinfelder to come up with a, what it would cost to put it into a contract form that we um, basically what we use boilerplate from the city. There were some things lacking in Elm's proposal as the electrician of uh, make sure we had enough insurance, uh, sure that other sub vendors were being paid, things like that that were spelled out in their proposal. So we're trying to do that and, and then do into unit pricing of uh, generator hours run rather than just a flat fee for the generator to be out there paying for the fuel directly to come in rather than an estimate of $25,000 worth of fuel. The goal is to get the contract under 100000 with us paying the fuel and then we can do a fairly straightforward Chapter 30 uh, B bid on this. So basically um, the test is still looking at uh, the generator and the, um, the panels and the switch gear being able to function, which currently we don't know if they do. Uh, based, the test requires bringing in three generators to run the parts of the plant that are required for uh, this test, which is going to be over the course of uh, three or four nights, and to uh, hook up the generators to the motor control panels, get them up and running, and then take the genera generator off and make it fully run through its switch gear with a, a low bank out there to see how it performs. And that way we have an idea of going forward what we have to do with the generator. Does the generator need replacement? Does the switch gear? Does all of it need replacement going forward in the future? And that's the only way we're going to determine this unless the board decides that we're just going to make it a capital project and replace everything out there and get it done and over with, which is about the last system I saw was $2.1 million to do the work. Wondering, what's chapter 149? Chapter 149 is work when you hit a third, third dollar threshold uh, for work in public facilities, vertical construction being building work. Versus chapter 30 is usually used for horizontal construction, water, sewer, train work, roadway work. What kind of, I'm, I've never heard of Elm. Uh, there's no reason I should have, but what, what do we know? We've done a lot of work with Elm Electric in the past. Actually, when the water treatment plant flooded, we used Elm up there to do all the work for us. Uh, we've used Elm Electric in the past for our industrial type work here in Northampton for wastewater and water. They're one of the best electric contractors out there. They have done a ton of work for us, as Ned had mentioned, and they're highly capable. They're very responsive. They do great work. So, from, from a qualification standpoint, you know, they're like the premier one out there doing it. So, so the original intent of this was this was going to be a, an engineering study, an engineering test, and that Kleinfelder went to AMP Services, they went to Elm, and I think they went to uh, Paul Suddy and Clark. They only got one bid back from Elm on it because they were searching who's going to be our low bidder and so on. They know the city uh, has a relationship with Elm at the plant already. So this is the proposal they came back with, and like I said, we're in the process of seeing how we can get these costs down so that we can bid it uh, another venue, because it's really not going to work underneath this, this test, this engineering study, because once they get in there, they're actually doing some maintenance type activity too, they're cleaning terminals off, which all of a sudden it kicks it into while well, you're doing services now, it's not just a test. So, and the other concern is, what if they find something wrong when they open something up and we got to replace this breaker, and it's twelve thousand dollars. Is it done under emergency procurement contract with the state? So we're trying to iron out these issues going forward, and so that hopefully at the next board meeting that we'll have a more firm proposal of what we're going to be doing. But the cost is still there. The cost is going to be six figures, six figures plus. I'm not sure how much money it's going to save, and we haven't really talked. We haven't, we've, we've talked about it, but. When you publicly bid things, you have bonding costs and you have other costs that get that they have to account for when they go through public bidding. So um, Elm put together a detailed estimate. I mean, I don't know how much money you can publicly bid it. I think Joe Cook thinks it's a good idea to do that to get more competitive bids. But at the end of the day, when you publicly bid something, you have more engineering costs in order to do it, which Ned had mentioned. And then you also have a contractor has to put up bid bonds and performance bonds and other bonds that cost money 
for them and it gets rolled into the job. So, um, you know, I don't know, you know, how low the price can come in this. I mean, it's kind of mind blowing in terms of the cost for the test. And um, we had a long, Ned and I had a long meeting with, with Kleinfelder and Elm about it and, and Kleinfelder's sub consultant and um, basically saying, well, what is going on here with the value of this test? I mean, it's so expensive. And we were trying to really get to the heart of whether there were you know, do we have options? What are the options? Why are we doing this thing now that it's so much money? Does it make sense? You know, the basic concept of spending, you know, $150,000, $200,000 on, on something like that, you know, you start to wonder whether it makes sense. And through the course of the meeting, I think what we found was that one of the benefits, as Ned had mentioned, was that it's not really only a test. It's a lot of preventive maintenance work that's going to be done on the electrical system, the generator system, and the switch gear, and the control panels, and everything, so that we're going to buy maybe five years of, um, I, I guess, five years of life in the system knowing that it will run well. So it's sort of a risk management strategy. If we don't do this, you could come up with some other partial test or just look at the generator under load or you do something else, which would be a, a portion of this, but it wouldn't be as comprehensive. So you'd be living with some risk knowing that you could have a problem that would happen like we've had in the past and then you'd end up having to deal with emergency situation and probably dealing with a lot of cost. Um, and it's going to take, even if we decided to replace the generator and a lot of the, a lot of the um, electrical panel stuff, you know, you, you're out three years anyway to do that. So I think the more we talked about it, it seemed like it, it still makes sense. Right, and they, I think we, we came to the conclusion that it still makes sense to do the test. It's unfortunate it costs a lot of money. But when you think about it from a risk management standpoint, that you're going to get at least five years of good operating backup power for the treatment plant, then it starts to make it starts to make pretty reasonable sense, I think. Um, could you explain why um, we need three temporary generators and then a fourth backup temporary? It's the sizing of the generators because there's three motor control panels that they're overdoing at different buildings. Yeah. So there's three separate locations. And the backup generator's weapon, if one of them fails, these three generators are doing the core operations of the plant. So they're not doing sludge processing, but they're running the aeration systems, the primary, secondary clarifiers, the, the core treatment of the plants being done with these. And will they will they be used during the test? Or are they only there in case some aspect of the test, some of the existing equipment doesn't work and we don't want to be stuck without power? They're actually running the plant while the test is being done. And we can't use, we can't use, you know, power from the grid. The power from the grid is taken, is taken off grid when this test is done. The national grid will be doing a full disconnect. I, I, I'm struggling a little bit. So we take, we take the plant off the grid. These three generators are running the plant. And we're not using our generator because we know it doesn't work, or we're not sure it's going to work? Because we're going to be testing that generator for the load bank. I see. So basically, okay. we're putting our so generator through the full motions that, you know, it's lost power. What's so it going I, to do? So I, <laughs> well, I know you've been through this. The transfer switch is going to work. Well, that's a piece of it, I guess. But can't we test our generator while the plant's on, on the grid? We can run our generator, yeah, but we can't load bank it. Okay. I'm sure all these questions have been asked long before now. But it is a stunning amount of money. I well, and it's money and just a lot of equipment. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's. I think I think when we see all the equipment in front of us, we'll realize what we're paying for. I mean, we're going to be paying for a lot of stuff and a lot of people working to hook things up and, and make it run. Yeah. But it is, it is quite an undertaking. And the standby there. generators, in case one of the three that we rented doesn't work. That's correct. Gary? Couldn't, couldn't, couldn't we get our money back on the three that doesn't work? <laughs> well, that's why we looked at unit prices. If, it doesn't, if it's not running, do we actually pay for it? Right. There's a right. nominal fee for the rental, but there's no hours put on it. That's one of the things that Kleinfelder was well, suggesting. I wouldn't, I wouldn't even pay for it if it doesn't work. <laughs> But there, there right. we got Gary, then Ro, then David. Well, I don't know if I have a question, but it's more of a comment. So I'm the setup is that 
you you're running the plant off grid because you have to shut the plant down to to the transfer switch, verify that that's working, and then the generator has to start, and then you have to load that thing. So if it fails, the plant is still running. And then you can re-energize the whole plant. And those other generators are still there. So if the grid goes down, you can still run the plant. But that's sort of what I'm seeing as a scenario. So while you're testing the generator with a load bank, you're completely loading it. If the thing blows up, and then the grid goes down, there's still generators out there. Exactly. So I, I can see the reason for, for having... You, you look at the worst case scenario ever. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but, uh, You're one cheery guy. Right. Yeah, right. Sorry. You know, happiness to me is a funny thing. It, it's, it's <laughs> weird, yeah, just, doom, doom, yeah. doom. And so having the fourth standby generator makes sense to me, too. Under that scenario, but anything can go wrong. And, and you, you just can't have the planet not run. Um, solid waste, or excuse me, sewer interface funding. Yeah. Excuse me. Yeah. Awesome. One more question. Sure. So part of the test would include the main gear as well, right? So yes. when, they, when Grid throws the, opens the switch, uh, there should be switches, not only a transfer switch, but there would be also manual switches. They would want to exercise some of the other gear that we have, I would think. And how could you do that without... I'm just sort of picturing how it would go down. Knowing what it's like at Smith, there's stuff that they haven't opened some of these breakers in decades. Mm -hmm. They have no idea what would happen. Well, my understanding, this hasn't been done at this facility in 30 plus years. Exactly. That's the same situation everywhere. Now. The word never comes to mind. Never done it. It's right, exactly. So when you open it, does it really open it? And when you try to close it again, does it really close? <laughs> You want to be able to take the thing apart and fix it if it, if it doesn't work right. That's correct. So you can't have, you can't obviously be energized. So. Anyway, I get it. Well, anyways, I just want to you know the board realized that this this is not a cheap test to be done. It's something that should be done, um, yeah. and we're just trying to figure out the best way to do the procurement of it and reduce our costs as much as we can. I'll probably be, end up renegotiating the. Uh, consent order with penalty on this uh, because it's going to extend past the 120 days at this point. So I'll be in touch with the state on that matter and keep them up to date of what we're doing and where we're going with this and ask for their blessing of a time extension. I think I, I, I think I look like that there's some forgiveness of the fine for us to use to there is, there is if um, we complete the requirements and also be violation free for a year. The other choice is you don't do the requirements of the consent order and you just pay the $5,100 fine. But we still should be doing the test. Money is in everything. I just well, don't want to repeat of what happened yeah. last fall. We had a discussion with Clydefield earlier. I was a little bit agitated about the consent order requirement that the test be done. And when we thought the test was going to be like a $50,000 test, and then it came back to be four times that. And, um, you know, consent orders, what I mentioned to Clydefield, is that consent order is negotiable. If we came up with some other means that would provide some sense of operation of the generators and the switch gear that didn't cost $200,000, we should be down in Springfield talking to the state about renegotiation of the the conditions of the consent order to see if they would accept some other alternate test that was less expensive. Mm -hmm. So my first volley, I think, would be trying to talk to them about a change to the procedures within the consent order, if it made sense to do that. Um, but clearly, at least the time extension, I think we need that. But broadly speaking, you're satisfied with there would be a substantial amount of maintenance work associated with this. There'll be maintenance work associated with that. It hasn't been touched. Things need to be cleaned, lubricated, put back together. They find little things wrong here and there. They'll fix them as we go. Uh, it's never been documented, the settings on these breakers. So you know, there will be a documentation after the fact on this of where these breakers are set at. And, um, it, it'll be a benefit to the city in the end, especially if we can, as Jim talked about, have an additional five years of life or so out of this while we create our large capital plans for that facility. Any other 
questions? So we look forward to hearing more. You will. <coughs> um, change order number two to contract 205-10 for landfill odor response to ECS in the amount of zero. Move approval. Second. This is a time extension to December 31st, 2013. The contract is uh, currently out of date time. Uh, there's still plenty of money left in the contract. Uh, we have some concerns that we might have continued odor complaints during the closure of the landfill as they move some, you know, some material around and waste around. There might be some releases. So we want to make sure that it's available for the rest of this calendar year. That's all. Any questions about that? All in favor of extending the contract for order response? Uh, change order number two to contract 227 12 for, for water supply um, asset management, for the water supply asset management system to Tate and Howard in the amount of zero. Move approval. Second. So this is a time extension again. Um, we have the draft, we've reviewed, we have reviewed the draft, and we're waiting for the final project to come back. This should actually get us to that point this June 30th date. So I think we should have our director negotiate all the change orders, because he comes up with zeros. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Wow. Um, yeah. Fairly not controversial. All in favor? Uh, you have a question. Uh, just that uh, this isn't uh, in any way throwing off our schedule in terms of what we were thinking about. No. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Yeah, and I think we also approve it. Good. Great. <laughs> Uh, old business, private ways. Private ways on April 27th, we're going to Graves Avenue, Depot Avenue, King Ave, Wilder Place, Park Avenue, and Edgewood Terrace. Um, and we should be looking at setting our next May schedule and which ways we're going to go see during the month of May. There was also a letter sent out prior to the last board meeting about the no letter to go to uh, Center Court and Bradford Street South. I asked for the board's input on it. I see two responses. Is everyone satisfied with that letter going yes. out? Yes. Certified mail? Okay. Yes. So that's all I have on private ways at the moment. I'm waiting to get drafts from our surveyor as to some of the layouts we've requested already at this point. I haven't seen anything yet. Jim? At the last board meeting, there was a gentleman here, I think, from the Board of Health, and there was some discussion about um, inviting planning board members to the Board of Public Works public hearings for private ways. Um, I did have a discussion with Carolyn Mish in the planning department about that. Um, they're actually, for the, the streets that um, Ned mentioned that the board's going to visit on the 27th, the planning board is actually going to be discussing those this Thursday. So the timing isn't quite right this time um, for it. But Carolyn appreciated um, the board's offer for future um, private way public hearings that come up. So I offered, you know, we would send them the dates in the streets for the public hearings and she would get them information from the planning board if they wanted to come and hear the residents. She said that most of the planning board members were viewing the streets on their own, but I told her that the, the stories from the residents are great and it's worth coming out from those alone. So. Okay. I just wanted to share that the conference committee on Monday, we had a discussion with them mm -hmm. about what, how we would proceed with the rest of them and there seems to be some support moving forward to try to create the budget, uh, the ballot initiative, so that we can put it on the ballot for the public to make a decision about whether or not to go ahead and allow us to expend money to just plow, rather than going through the expense of doing the survey and acceptance process that we're going through. Are you saying we're wasting our time? <laughs> I think there was some concern that this might be a a, a costly endeavor, and that we might just arrive at the same thing by getting it on the ballot. That the cost of surveying and all that stuff over 45 streets might be something we could afford to pay in plowing for the next century? <laughs> no, actually, it, it would be fairly fast. We're spending over 15000 a year to plow uh -huh. private ways, and we're foregoing approximately 15000 on Chapter 90 money because they're not listed as city streets. Oh, so the the numbers. So it's almost a push. Mm. Huh. Until you start repaving them. Pardon me. Until you start repaving them. 
This doesn't, this doesn't actually change the status <laughs> of paving them. Yeah. We have a, we have paid them management software that uh, creates you. a hierarchy of paving rates. And uh, it's not that it, once it becomes a public way, it doesn't become a city street and you're responsible for what city streets mm -hmm. get done on them. That's right. Correct. It's true. We don't. So just the fact that we don't care <laughs> and we pay them and in, in in order. Um, I think that's it on private ways. Cool. Um, Stormwater and flood control task force. Do you want to date the name? Um, oh, yeah. two, two go rounds ago, I, I would have to say, I, I would think, I, I would, my position was with this committee wasn't going to get anywhere. Uh, we spent an inordinate amount of time talking about budgets and things like that. And uh, last go round, it seems like a couple people had to come Jesus moments, and and uh, there was there was there was a real I think I think a real consensus that we need to get this done in a timely manner. I think we still believe that the that the um, uh, the uh, city council's May one deadline is a little unrealistic, but that, but we can work within a cycle where if we're going to move forward with an enterprise fund, it could be done by it in time for a final final vote by the city council by October, which is where they want to be. Um, there was a real refocus on a very narrow interpretation of the committee's charter, which I think really helped spur move, movement forward, that what we were there to do was come up with a recommendation about a fee schedule and nothing more. Uh, and that seemed to move a couple of people. And so um, we were charged. Um, in a, in a manner that would comply with open meeting laws, and not not too much inter, interpersonal react, act, activity between now and then, to work amongst ourselves to come up with proposed fee schedules that we could bring forward for discussion at our next meeting on the 18th. So it seems like there's some movement. Um, would you want to add anything to that? No. The conference committee last Monday voted, made a formal vote to set the deadline as May 31st. 31st. I, I, I don't think that's out of whack. I think that, I think, and the other thing that came up, and this is the intriguing part, was that there was a real sort of meeting of the minds, certainly it caught my attention, which was that everybody is going to participate in this process in some way, shape, or form, as far as being a payer for every property. Everybody. So we haven't figured out what that means yet, but that that we were gonna we were gonna we were gonna come up with a fee schedule that was that would capture all 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 aspects of the community. Um, I think property owner obviously is gonna have something to do with it, but uh, uh, there's a lot of, you know there there are some there are differing ideas about you know whether it's about permeable or lot size or whatever, and I think it's gonna be some sort of hybrid that that takes all the various components into that in account. It will almost certainly be tiered in some way, shape, or form, wouldn't you say? It was interesting tiering. Yeah, a lot of interesting tiering. So, um, and my personal interest is finding some way to, to generate credits. Um, uh, I haven't even figured out how that's going to be done, but I'd like to spend some time thinking about that specifically between now and the 18th. So, so. so I was much much more optimistic coming out of last week's than I was the week before. Where I just like we might as well just hand out guns and shoot each other because there's <laughs> anything to go anywhere. <laughs> Any follow-ups? Only that I'm building a rain garden this summer. Do you want to? I would like to. I would like to figure out a way. I might video it. One of, and one of the questions, the interesting debates, and I don't want to spend too much time about this, is what do you do for people who who do on-site remediation because they're required to? Is part of new construction to comply with existing statutes, as opposed to somebody who does a retrofit. There was a broad, there was a broad understanding that if you did a retrofit, you ought to, you ought to get credit. But Terry made the point, which is, why should you punish somebody because they're complying with the law? And I, I thought that was an interesting argument. I, I, we're going to have to deal with that yeah. one. We're going to have to deal with that one. And I'm not sure how to do it. Uh, but there, are, there, are, there are brighter minds than I who have experience in generating fee schedules and things like that who are already looking at this. So I'm, I'm, I'm cautiously optimistic that we can come up with something, and hearing that the deadline is the end of the month, I think that that, that could be within our grasp. I just wanted you to focus on your 
Yeah, I think I think that I think that there there are, like I said that there are minds out there who are who are really motivated around that. So you think Teddy Bear will be marketing Olympic kidney and vernal pools? Uh, pools? <laughs> I don't know. I don't know. I don't know. I mean, I would I would love to see something where we can get you know the average the average citizen involved, even if it's at in a, in a you know um, not necessarily. Product, not necessarily overly productive, but participatory manner of sure. getting getting it done. You know? um, and there are clear, clearly there are examples out there of communities that have adopted some sort of credit program. And I, I just want to spend a little time looking at them so I could be a little more thoughtful about it. But but it, but it it, it, it feels it feels right with me. So. Thank you. Okay, great. And next are uh, street musicians. Permit changes. So, in your board package, there was a, a copy of the current um, or proposed uh, restrictions. Item number five in particular has been highlighted, bolded, and underscored. <laughs> so, so you won't miss it. But basically, this is dealing with the concern that uh, came out of me and I had a few weeks ago uh, with downtown business owners, the bid, and uh, the mayor's office. Uh, including uh, the economic development coordinator, about keeping the street musicians moving and not going to one particular business turn all day long. We currently have a, a family, a few musicians that are complying generally with it, but they're leaving for 15 or 20 minutes and then coming back to the same spot again. So this way, we believe that this language change keeps them from going back in that one spot on any particular day, that they just keep moving systematically down or up a street in downtown. When we approved the Himalayan singing board. I was going to say, where did that come from? We, we actually had a demonstration. We did cool. have a demonstration. <laughs> I haven't seen them down there. Oh. No, I haven't either. Not since that first time. <laughs> Any thoughts or comments before we vote? I guess we need a motion to approve the uh, <clears throat> amendment. I make a motion that we approve uh, the amendment to the street musician restrictions. Second. Okay. Do we have to have a discussion about the letter of complaint we got? Or can we just go past that? I don't think that's a policy. Uh, no. I mean, no, we're not music critics. Yeah. Well, we are. Oh, well, yeah, yeah, yeah. There, there, is, there is a decibel. decibel. There is a decibel, yes. Mm -hmm. yeah. 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 But, but good or bad, good or bad steel drum playing is not our purview. Yeah. So I want to, I want to, I have to say something, but I said something even about that. I didn't realize that there were actually two steel drummers downtown, and I think the one I said that didn't sound too bad is the one that doesn't sound too bad, and that there's another one that I haven't heard that probably is not as good, based on the comment. Just to, clarify, just to clarify my comment. All right, so all in favor of changing the street musician permits such that people can't return to the same spot on any given day. All right. Aye. 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 So we have, um, just so the board knows, I think we have 13 permits out this year so far. We'll send certified letters to them all with a new policy. That way they're aware of it. We have a lot more than that. They've been coming in fast and furious. The police must have been down there. Um, all right, and finally, uh, an update on Pulaski Park. Um, I think I had told the board at the last meeting that it wasn't looking good for the grant, and I can confirm that I was accurate in my previous <laughs> statements. Um, we were notified by the CPC staff person that uh, at their last meeting they voted not to award um, any money for the Pulaski Park renovation design. Um, what they did tell me was that in sort of an unusual move for the CPC, they were apparently going to craft something in writing and send it to the board or to me or to somebody indicating what the concerns of what the grant application were, which is something they don't they don't do usually. Um, so I have a pretty good sense from being at the meetings what their concerns are, but we'll look forward to hearing what they have to say. There's another grant round in the fall. We'll have to figure out whether it makes sense to uh, apply for another grant. I think um, one of the big hurdles for this project is the cost, and from, from their perspective, and getting uh, an understanding of what it costs to completely renovate that park to meet 
all the needs that the citizens of the community have indicated you know, the last two, three, four years. So um, it's really kind of an interesting problem, a little perplexing at times, because as a community, it leaves me wondering who decides what's the right amount to invest in that, in that park downtown. Um, and, you know, the, we had the work that Stimson did, it indicated it was about a $1.5 million construction project, but um, Nancy Denig's work also was about the same cost to develop the same type of facility for the, for the park. And I think, so we know it's a real number, we checked the, we checked the construction cost estimates and things and they're accurate, but clearly spending that type of money in the park for the people on the CPC was just, they were blown away by it. They just couldn't understand why it would be so much. And I don't know if there's more education that's necessary, but they were asking questions about can you do a smaller project out there? And of course, I mean, you can always do a smaller project, but it may not meet the needs that everyone in the community has indicated what they'd like to see. So really, who decides in the city what's the right renovation to do? I mean, it's really an interesting thing. The board spent a ton of time going through uh, park renovation ideas, and I tried to convey that in the grant application, and I, I thought it, uh, you know, I thought I did a fairly reasonable job, but it didn't really come across that way. Um, but I, you know, I've heard from some people in the community since we found out we weren't getting the grant that um, people are um, a little bit upset and they want us to submit another grant application. And I think people may be more vocal next time in the community um, because if the public comment session this time uh, only Bob Reckman showed up in support of it, and there was nobody else. And as soon as, and, and it's funny because as soon as I found out we, we weren't getting the grant, I got a call from a couple of people asking what the status was. I was like, well, the status isn't great. So I don't know in the future, you know, the, there's the budget, there's gathering more um, community support at the actual CPC committee meetings so that we can see people turning out saying we think this is a good idea. Um, but I think those are the main, really the main hurdles for the cost and um, getting them to understand it. And, um, it might be helpful too, I guess, there's a lot of state grant money that, that goes to help construction, but still there'd be some, there'd, there'd be other CPC money that would be necessary or potentially some money from the general fund that would be necessary to fill in the gap that wouldn't be covered by the state grant. So that's a little nebulous when you read it. It's not exactly related to the grant, it's related to the overall success of the project. So having a couple of those things um, more detailed might be helpful for them. I think Wayne does a lot of CPC type of grants. I know, you know, things are always a little gray in the early stages of a project in terms of how the, where the money's how the money's going to come together to build them. But uh, anyway, there's work to be done, and I guess we'll be looking in the fall at another another grant round and, and see what we can do with it. Do you imagine, Jim, that they might have considered a grant for the design? This was for the design. We were looking for 100 and, yeah, with the design. That's the other, the other thing that's interesting is that I was at meetings and wasn't always called to answer questions, which was a little, felt a little awkward to me. I talked to the staff person about that, but they had questions about the cost of the design as a percentage of construction seemed high. And it was high, but there were reasons, there were, there, there were responses to the questions that they had. I wasn't really able, I wasn't called on to articulate them or answer them. And so, the whole thing felt a little bit awkward. Um, there were, the costs were high because there was a lot of interest in the community to, to get some type of connection between the bike path and the roundhouse lot in Pulaski Park. So there was an allowance for a structural engineer to look at is it, you know, what's, what's the feasible way to get a connection there? Does it make sense to do it? So that's something you wouldn't normally have in a park design project, so it raises the cost. And then uh, another big concern that we heard a couple of years ago was about lighting in the park and a lot of people didn't feel safe and how we're going to come up with some type of lighting scheme that's going to work well within the park. So there was an allowance for an electrical engineer to come in and work out a, a lighting scheme that would appropriately light the park and, you know, when it's dark. And again, that's something that's sort of above and beyond what you normally would have a landscape architect do. So there were a couple of things there that, that made the, and these were allowances because we didn't have exact scope for what the structural engineer was going to do and that sort of thing. So the, the cost was, uh, you know, a little higher as a percentage of construction, and there was a reason for it, but we never really able to, to talk to them about it. And then, you know, there were just other questions about, you know, how come the architect is in Cambridge and not local? And I mean, we, we explained in the grant, 
the lengthy process that the board went through to reach the point where they were with, with Stimson and Associates. And I thought it was pretty well described, but um, so you know, it's, it's really hard to. It's an interesting process for sure. Gary, anything we missed? Uh, no. 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 All right, Chris. I'm good. All set. Mike, you're going to get out on time. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Well, I'm hoping. It's close, unless Ned has something big. I have nothing else. DJ? Yeah. Andrew? Yeah. Well, yeah. What, do we have any idea what the strategy of the mayor is regarding the override and where we might or might not fit into the picture? I think might not is the picture. word. <laughs> well, I mean, I've, I've heard nothing. I think that's the word over. There's an organizing committee on April 24th. There's a mayor's committee. Um, is that, I think it's the no, community. No, community. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yes. Okay. But at the same time, isn't there, there, it sounds like there's some good news on the Chapter 9B money at the state level. I think that's what I was hearing. That there was a sense that they would free up the Chapter 90 money in advance. Or? Time will tell. Yeah, they're proposing it. Right? Yeah. It's all in the, yeah. well, the, the state budget. Process. It'd be nice to see a large increase in it. That'd be wonderful for Northampton. And I just don't know if it's going to happen or when it's going to happen. I was at the Rosenberg's Municipal Conference on Saturday, and there was there seemed to be some consensus between the governor's budget and what the legislature was thinking that the Chapter 90 would come out at 300 million, and there was some sense that they wanted to get that out early because of the construction season concerns. But we'll believe it when we see it. Katie, sorry, I didn't yeah. I didn't mean to waylay your your issue there. Well, I mean, to me, the chapter 90 money is pretty critical. Well, yeah. yeah. I got nothing. I made a motion to adjourn. Second. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Thanks. Thank you.